One of the things I want to do is orientate you. You're not in a conference center anymore. You're in an emergency department. That emergency department is on the outskirts of Melbourne. It's a mixed department. It's not a tertiary thing. We don't have access to all the services that you might expect. And I'm what I actually am in real life, which is an emergency physician. Relatively junior, don't have any gray hair. And some of the things that I'm gonna to confront today are challenging. They're gonna be challenging to me, but they might also be challenging to you as an audience. And for people that are gonna be watching this online when it's published, there's a little bit of a warning here. You're gonna watch some stuff that's gonna to be tough. If you're underage, turn off now. Let's start to introduce things. I've got a panel, and I'm very, very lucky. This is the panel that I might not have on my job right when I need them. This is the panel. On the left here as we start, almost the man that needs no introduction, Damien Rowland, an expert, paediatric emergency physician, a researcher, a fine mind, an experienced emergency physician. It's going to be good to have him on board. I've got to run home. I've just finished my shift. Uh, I've got one patient in the department. She's a 15-year-old girl. Yeah. Uh, her name's Emma. She was six, I think. Yeah. She's coming right early out of foster pain. She looks pretty well. She's texting. Uh, but she was pretty tender right early out of foster. Yep. So I'm just getting some bloods and an ultrasound sent off. Are you happy to chase all that up? Yeah, sure. Uh, she, she's on her way. I think think mum's on her way. I think she, she said she was going to call her. Okay, so likely to go home? Uh, yeah, I think, I'm, I'm sure everything's fine. I was just, was just a little worried. Could have a little shot. I know. I think it's going to be all right. I'm sure she'll go. Have you spoken to Mum? Uh, no, no. She, yeah, uh, Emma called her. Okay. Thank you. All right. See you, mate. Good luck. Our second panel member, again, oh, needs no introduction to this conference. Liz Crow, an extraordinary social worker, an extraordinary mind, compassionate, wise sister to half of FOMED and medical education in her spare time, and an ethics committee member of your hospital as well. I am. Could be handy. So we have, sorry. Yeah, hi, Ian Summers, emergency department. Oh, yes, hi, Ian. Uh, Alex Henry here. I'm a radiology registrar today. Look, are you yeah. the doctor looking after the patient, Emma Bryant? Uh, yeah, I've just been handed over and why? Look, she, she's just come back, uh, just left our ultrasound department. I'm calling because I'm a little concerned. That there's something in her right adnexa, but we couldn't get a clear view and we didn't want to do a transvaginal scan. Um, yeah. The, the uterus was empty. We couldn't see the ovary, but there is a small amount of free fluid there. Uterus empty, something in the right adnexa, free fluid. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Well, she's nice and stable. Any suggestions? Uh, I, I don't know. You'll have to, have to see the patient. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> I love the handovers. Interesting. The third panel member, Catherine Lorenz, is the senior counsel for Monash Health, previously been legal counsel for Royal Children's Hospital, and you have another qualification high up in exec, and Catherine, I've forgotten what it is under my nerves. Governance? Yes. Fantastic. So uh, again, a fine legal mind to have beside me, just in case I was to need it. Sorry. Yeah, hello. Emergency Hi, Ian Summers here. Hi, Ian. This is uh, Tim from Pathology. Are you looking after an Emma Briant? Yeah. Just a reporting oh. result for you. We've just got a beta HCG back of 12,000. 12,000? 12,000. Beta ACG. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Emma Bryant. Okay, thank you. Right adnexal mass. Empty uterus. Beta ACG 12,000. Damien Rowland, can I ask your thoughts? What are we dealing with here? So, uh, I've if I go straight to the, the top of things that I'd be worried about uh, with, with this girl is uh, an ectopic pregnancy just kind of shoots out there with an empty uterus and a BC, uh, HCG that's high. Um, right. I suppose there are some other weird and wonderful differentials 
Um, but given that we've not really seen the patient yet, uh, I'd be um, <laughs> going to want to do a clinical exam as well. All right, that sounds fine. <laughs> let's, let's narrow things down and we'll say that this is an ectopic. And I'm wondering what actually the significance is going to be, because some of these people are, are paediatrics doctors and some of them haven't done a lot of gynaecology for a while. So what does actually that mean for this patient? Walking, hemodynamically stable, um, seems relatively well and doesn't have too much pain. What's it actually going to mean for that patient? Is your mic going? Uh, thank you. He just wanted a bit of action. <laughs> yeah, he loves a bit of action. Let's try and give him some. Sorry, what was the question again? So what is the implications for the patient of, of who's hemodynamically stable about the ectopic? Okay, so to just kind of medically, um, if we've... Uh, ruled out any ongoing particular issue that needs an urgent surgical uh, uh, intervention. Mm. There's kind of three options for ectopic pregnancies. You can do expectant management, medical management, or, or surgical management. In teenagers, it does depend on your local pediatric gynecological services of what they're used to. Most is managed surgically. Um, but there are lots of case reports now of methotrexate being used to terminate the pregnancy in a teenage group. An expectant is not something that a lot of people recommend, but has been reported. Okay, so what is the option of just letting you go home and ignoring this? Um, so, <laughs> purely from a medical standpoint, it is possible to let things uh, take their course without uh, uh, potential harm to the individual, although actually the, the risks of long-term kind of complications and fertility in the future are huge. Yep. So I would not be recommending letting All right. uh, this particular individual. That sounds fine. So the word here is rupture. I think we're, we're worried about this potential for late bleeding. We're worried about it to the extent that this might be life-threatening. At the moment, things are nice and stable. If we send her home at some stage, it's a little bit like sending home a ticking time bomb. We don't really know what's going to happen, but it could be really nasty. Now, it's great that we had that little bit of time because I've been on the computer and I've checked up and about four years ago she fractured her arm and when she was in here last time, her mum was in here as well and I've got mum's mobile number. Liz Crow, should yes, I call that number now? I wouldn't, I wouldn't be rushing to call mum until <coughs> I've had a conversation with this girl because... Okay. 15-year-old sexually active, whether or not she knows she's done something to get pregnant is always... Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I have to tell you something. Um, <laughs> I have a friend who once said to a young girl who was asking for contraception, are you sexually active? And she said, uh, no, I don't think so. And he said, well, why do you want the pill? And she said, oh, no, I just lie there. So... Um, <laughs> I think it's really important that we make sure that young people actually a know what you know what's happened and b what the family situation is because she could be estranged, she could be under the Department okay. of Child Safety, okay. it could be a member of the family who's impregnated her. So it's um, really wise to just take a pause and go and actually talk to this child. All right, that sounds fine. Catherine, I'm going to come back to you in a moment, if that's OK, and we're going to ask you a couple of questions about um, this idea of, of age and the, what its implications are and a few other things. But we're just going to come back, because I'm going to take Liz's advice. And what I would love, of course, is if Liz came with me, which is what I would normally do, is take somebody else with me to have this conversation. But hopefully it'll go well. Hi there. Um, Emma, my name's Ian. I didn't meet you before. You were looked after by um, Dr. Andrew. But um, I wanted to have a chat to you about some of the things that are coming back from the results of the tests that we did. Yeah. Um, are you feeling OK? Are you, are you comfortable? I feel fine. OK. Um, I'd be keen to chat to your mum as well. Is, is your mum here yet? My mum doesn't care. She's not coming. She's not coming? No. OK. Um, I've got a bit of news to tell you, and I, I would love to be able to tell Mum at the same time. Is it OK if I call Mum and we have a chat together? She doesn't care. She doesn't want to come. OK. <laughs> the things that, that I'm going to tell you, there's some serious things that are happening here. Um, 
there's a surprise for me, and it might not be a surprise to you, but we've done a test. One of those tests is a pregnancy test in the blood test that we took. And it's come back and the results are showing that you're pregnant. Mm, no. There's a bit more as well. This isn't just a pregnancy in the usual place that it occurs where the pregnancy is in your uterus or your womb. This is a pregnancy where the pregnancy has stopped going down the fallopian tube, which is the tube that goes from the ovary down into your uterus, and is now sitting in that fallopian tube. And this is serious. What the heck? This isn't true. I want to go. I'm going to call my friend. She's going to pick me up. My phone's flat. I need to charge it. OK, I've got about five minutes while that phone gets charged again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Christ, <the> iPhones. <laughs> <coughs> if I do nothing, my suspicion is that Emma will be out of my department in a hurry. I did say I was going to come back to Catherine, Catherine Lorenz. Could I stop Emma leaving? Uh, I'll give you the usual lawyer answer. It depends. OK. <laughs> What I might do then is, in expectation of a lawyer answer, I'll have a seat, you take the stage, and could you guide me through the sorts of considerations that I might have to make on a child of this age about her ability to consent to treatment, refuse treatment, or actually discharge herself at risk? Sure. Thanks, Ian. Um, given what's going on in this emergency department today, it's good that I can refresh my mind about the Australian law relating to consent, confidentiality, self-discharge relating to um, children who might be mature minors. So what we'll be thinking about here is what kind of procedures can she consent to on her own if she doesn't want her parents to know? Um, what age does she need to be to do that? Can she self-discharge? And and importantly, what can Ian and the other medical practitioners tell her mother in the event that she doesn't want them to know anything about the treatment? Do parents have a right to know? So in Australia, there are procedures to which neither, any, um, any, neither parents or children can um, consent to, even if the parents, the child and the child's doctor wishes them to. And we know that the, some of these treatments are known as special medical procedures, and they include non-therapeutic uh, sterilisation, among other things. The law is evolving in this space since the High Court handed down its decision in 1992 in Marion's case, where it basically set out the law for mature minors and consent to treatment. So the concept of mature minors independently consenting to the tr their own treatment is really a recognition of the law that children, especially older children, have some kind of right to make autonomous decisions about their lives. That includes medical decisions. This right is enshrined in United Nations um, conventions, including the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which was ratified by Australia in 1990. And most of you may know it's also been enshrined in the Human Rights Charter in Victoria. The Convention sets out a number of principles which are highly relevant to medical treatment and young people. These, and this includes the right of all children to express their views freely on all matters concerning themselves. Sounds reasonable so far. Additionally, there's also growing recognition in the law that some children may be deprived of necessary or desirable treatment if parental consent is required or if parental um, consent is withheld for a particular treatment. So, when can a child consent and for what? The age at which a child can, is sufficiently mature to consent independently to treatment depends not only on the age of the child and the maturity, but also the type of procedure in question. In Australia at the moment, children younger than 16 or even 14 can independently consent to many procedures if they're sufficiently mature to understand the proposed treatment. 
they are known at law as mature minors. The legal test is known as Gillick competence, and that was named after an English court decision which was accepted by the Australian High Court in 1992 in Marion's case. So, to determine competence, a doctor really needs to be satisfied that the child has sufficient understanding and intelligence to fully understand what is proposed. Sounds simple so far. The sort of factors that doctors are expected to consider by the law are the maturity of the young person, being their capacity to understand and appreciate the proposed treatment, and the consequences on, of the treatment. This, of course, includes the consequences or possible consequences of not receiving treatment. It also, they're expected to consider the gravity of the presenting illness and treatment and family issues. So, if a child is 16 or 17, living independently of their parents, self-sufficient, self-supporting, it's more likely that a court would find they're entitled to consent by themselves. Once a doctor does accept that a child is a mature minor and can consent to the treatment, the doctor is then obliged to inf not to inform the child's parents about the child's condition or the treatment undertaken unless the child gives permission to do so. The more serious or invasive the procedure and the greater the risks, the more carefully the doctor needs to assess the child's level of understanding. The capacity of children below 18 years to consent to medical procedures independently of their parents is recognised by the Medicare system. <coughs> For example, if a child is over the age of 14 years, a doctor can bulk bill Medicare for the consultation, with or without advising the parents. A separate Medicare card can be issued to children above the age of 15 years. There is, however, a wide gulf in the law between the capacity to consent to life-saving treatment and the capacity to refuse it. There are instances in the case law, many instances, where judges have ruled that the child in question is of sufficient intelligence to, and is capable of making decisions about his or her well-being, and the court accepts that the child may even know that to refuse treatment would lead to death as a result, but courts will often still decide against the mature minor's decision. Judges often do this, uh, make a decision against the child's um, refusal on the principle of the best interests of the child within the parents' patrian jurisdiction of the courts. This has some interesting consequences because a mature, a mature minor's decision, so a doctor has determined a child is a mature minor, they're capable of making a, decisions and yet a decision for themselves and yet that's overridden by the court. This wouldn't be the case for a competent 18-year-old and we can all imagine situations where this could lead to absurdities. For example, somebody who's 17 years and 11 months may not be able to make the same decision as a person who is 18, of lesser intelligence and lesser able to make informed decisions about their health care. Interesting issues also arise when a mature minor seeks treatment for complex or contentious procedures. What is the doctor's position, for example, if a mature 15-year-old girl wants to have cosmetic surgery? It would appear on the basis of the legal principles that I've just set out for you, that if after carefully explaining the procedure, the doctor is satisfied that the girl is sufficiently able to understand what's involved in the cosmetic procedure, then the treatment would be lawful on the basis of the child's consent alone. If I were advising you in that position, of course, I would tell you that it might be a very good idea to try to persuade the girl to inform her parents and to try to obtain their consent as well. Then, if a question later arises about the girl's maturity and her capacity to consent, the doctor would then be protected by the parent's consent 
and would thus be in a better position legally if something went wrong. So where does this leave us with the obligation of confidentiality? If a mature minor seeking treatment refuses to tell her parents about the, that she's seeking treatment, the doctor may be justified in breaching confidentiality and informing the parents directly only if there is a real risk to the child's safety or well-being. Consent to treatment and consent to handling information are related concepts, but they're not the same. There is little in the case law to, do, to, to help us decide about some of the interesting privacy and confidentiality issues. Catherine, I'm just going to interrupt you for a sec. That iPhone is charging fast. Oh, right. <laughs> right. We've got, oh. a, we've got maybe a minute. I prefer to talk about the law for a long time, but sometimes <laughs> patients get in the way, Ian. Um, why don't we can come back? I think you should get back to the patient. Ian. No, no, that's fine. Thank you. Um, what I've taken from that, I think, is, is the word maybe. That maybe <laughs> I can stop her. Maybe I need to explore it. Definitely I will need to document hard. Definitely I will need to do my best to persuade her to stay and to involve her parents. Yes. I'm hoping that's an okay judgment of where to go from there. And I'm internally grateful for the fact that actually um, this is not Emma, this is Scarlett. Scarlett is not pregnant and Scarlett is actually not a moody teenager. She's an absolute delight. So could you thank Scarlett for uh, her role here? <laughs> we'll allow you to go down onto the stage and just go up into AV and change your mics. Mm -hmm. While we're setting up the next patient that's going to happen in this emergency department, I'll ask Andy to have a look through his Twitter feed um, to see if there are any questions that have come through. My team can now um, come up on stage. Just ignore any activity that's happening over there for the moment and concentrate your eyes this way, please. Are there any questions that arose? So I think a lot of people commented they want Liz Crow to be there when they were having difficult, these difficult conversations at work. Yes, Bloody absolutely. Hell. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah. And a couple of people have point wondered really with the advent of My Health Record and Electronic Health Records, how much of this would go into one of those? Asking what you'd document. How much would go into My Health Record that could be reviewed by every single doctor that ever looked after this patient? Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Uh, it's unlikely that if this um, young Emma came into our emergency department that she would have opted out, which is a requirement of my health record, is my understanding. In which case, um, I'm guessing some of it would go through. Do you know the answer to that, Catherine? Or um, that's my understanding. Yes. And her parents may be able to see the record. Access that um, the freedom of information. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, certainly, if I was in this current climate of the next, I don't know whether it's a month or two, and I was writing my discharge letter, I would be very much aware of the fact that it would be auto-faxed to the GP unless I put a stop on that process. Mm. That's often the case in most hospitals. Nod if that would happen in yours, that would be an auto-fax to the GP. I think it puts also an obligation on us then to check those sorts of things, to say, this is information that is going to be get sent to your GP. You might even say why it is that you think that's a good idea. But let people know, is that OK? Do I have your consent for that information to be released? And then a reliable system in your hospitals to be able to prevent that happening on an auto process as well if you decide that that's the case. Can I also suggest with a child like this, it's unlikely she has a regular GP. True. And it's also very hard to talk to a lawyer from an ED. You know what I mean? This is a... Yeah. I don't know anyone who's ever been able to get a lawyer from the ED that quickly. Raise your hand. Monash. Oh. Yes, I was going to say. <laughs> um, my previous career before St Vincent's was at Monash Health, and I used to get on very, very well with your predecessor, John Snowden. Oh, yeah. Yes. And I had John Snowden on a speed dial, and he was an absolute delight under making high we pressure never can. medico legal. And I'm sure Catherine is the same. Most systems, I would guess, have that person. Um, depend in, in other jurisdictions, lawyers aren't, aren't necessarily employed by the hospital. They're yeah. employed by the Department of Health. Okay. So it, Victoria is quite unique that we have um, resources available. I, I always tell, um, usually tell the clinicians, they're usually better off speaking to a more senior clinician first. Um, and then if the head of unit or some, the most senior person on the shift should speak to the lawyer first. And the reason for that is I, 
um, these are often difficult calls that you need to make. It's, and they need to be done with clearly with a, purely a clinical hat on. And the law is really there to guide you, um, but it's, I'm obviously not the decision maker. So we tend to keep that in mind a little bit as well. We absolutely would not have access to a lawyer. Okay. Interesting. All right. I might start practicing Queensland. Sounds like there's a gap. Gap there. <laughs> well, I've I've rung our lawyer before, and I'm, I'm the fastest time anyone's gotten back to me is about 19 hours. Okay. All right. I've been very fortunate then. <laughs> so um, I'm also aware of the fact that it's a busy emergency department, and in fact, I've just had a call come through um, the bat phone from the ambulance saying that they're bringing somebody through to us very very soon. They're going to be arriving in about one or two minutes' time. It's basically somebody that's just come from the corner and they've, they've scooped because they know it's close. The information that we have is that they're bringing a 16-year-old uh, into the hospital who is profoundly hypoxic, hypotensive pre-arrest, and we're going to get a team sorted very, very quickly. We know that there's some background on this patient. We know that this patient has severe cerebral palsy, and we think that... Um, the quality of life from the bits of information we've got over the handover is relatively low. So I just want to get set up with this team here. Um, we've got... Uh, Brendan, are you going to have you do airway? Yeah. Clarissa, airway nurse. Frank, what are you going to do? If we, if we need CPR, cannabis circulation, is that OK? Defib, Alex, you're happy to use Defib? I'm happy. go from there. Uh, we'll just push that one into life. I oh, know that's right. We'll take that one off. Put that in and on when patient arrives. Oops. And patient should be hopefully arriving soon, I think. Guys, she's just arrested just as we come to it. This is the back door that you're expecting. All right. 16 year old girl. Into position with the defib, please. Um, Andrew, we'll get a proper handover from you once we relieve you. You can get the monitors on, please. A rhythm check as soon as possible. You got IV access, Andrew, is that right? Yeah, it's got an 18 gauge uh, on the left side there. Okay, are we ready with the defib yet? Keep going, guys. Let me know as soon as we're in position. All right, pads are on, guys. Pads are on, Alex. So we're going to do a rhythm check. So compressions continue, please. Oxygen away, everyone else away. Okay, we're going to charge our defib. Hands off the chest. We've got what looks like a bradycardia. Can you just do a quick pulse check, Brendan? It's disarmed. CPR okay. back on, Frank. Thank you. Okay, have a listen into the handover. One milligram of adrenaline, please, a candace and a good flush to come through. And we'll just have a listen to this handover. Everybody quiet, please, so that we can concentrate. Hi, so this is uh, Melissa. She's a 16 year old girl that we called through. Uh, she's got severe cerebral palsy, she's bed bound, has a, a number of seizures each day and takes bed. Yep. She's going unwell for a day or so with some fevers and cough. Yep. Um, it, she was in the ICU at the Royal Hospital recently, I'm um, not quite sure exactly what's going on. Mm. And when we got to her, we haven't had a blood pressure, she had SATs in the 80s, which looked awful. We basically put a line in it and run here. Okay. Excellent. So I think that's confirmed a lot about what we know. We now know also that we've got a PEA arrest that we're dealing with as well. Um, is the, did you say the parents are coming in? Uh, yeah, Mum shouted as we left, uh, don't do anything all right, but she was on her way. I don't think she followed us in the ambulance, so she should be here. But I think Dad's on his way as well. Okay. Candice, can you just give a milligram of adrenaline if you haven't already, please? All right, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to have a good chat to um, the parents who I think are coming into the relatives' room. Um, Brendan, hold off intubating. Let's just keep going as we are while we try and exclude anything reversible. I'll let you know where we progress from there. Um, thanks, Andrew. And can I get you to clear a little bit of space as I come yeah, into the course. relatives' room here? Guys, can we have a, a litre of fluid through, please? Can you go around? Hartman's is fine. Can you go around? And we'll just do another rhythm check now, OK? So compressions continue, oxygen away, all else clear. Hands off, please. Hi there. Um, Neil Melissa's father. OK. Yeah. Thanks for coming in, Neil. I'm Sasha. Uh, and ho hello, Sasha. I just wanted to tell you about what's been happening, but also to ask you a number of questions and to find out a little bit more about your daughter. What's your daughter's name? Melissa. Melissa. OK. I'm afraid there's a little bit of pressure on us at the moment because Melissa's needing our care very, very quickly and urgently. 
There are a number of things I've been told by the ambulance officers and I wanted to check those with you. My understanding is that she's been ill for a couple of days with a fever and a cough and that she's maybe aspirated in the past as well and that's the suspicion of that and what might have happened today. Yeah. If any of this is wrong, just correct me because I'm trying to establish what information we know about your daughter. I understand that Melissa has had a problem in the past with a severe cerebral palsy and that she's normally unable to get out of bed, normally isn't able to communicate at all, and that she's fed through a peg tube, is that, is that right? Yeah, she's completely dependent on everything. She doesn't get out of bed, she's incontinent, she's having seizures every day. Okay, okay. I want to fill you in on what's happened since then, and I'm sorry there's no good news about the information that I'm giving you at all. When Melissa arrived in this hospital, her heart had stopped. Oh my God. The ambulance officers have started doing CPR or chest compressions. At the moment, the team of very senior doctors are looking after her, continuing that process. They're going to be doing tests to see if there's anything that they can do to stop this process. I'm not sure what you mean, stop, stop the process? To get her heart restarted. But we heard something that you might have said to one of the ambulance officers, and that's why I'm concerned to come and speak to you so quickly, as well as to let you know what's happening, but to help, in a way, guide our treatment. My understanding is that you said to the ambulance officers that you didn't want anything heroic done, and I just wanted to check what it was that you understood by that and what it was that you meant by that. We've been through this before. She was in ICU six months ago and she needed a breathing tube and it took her ages to come off it and she's never quite recovered. She got better, yeah. but she's not back to her baseline. She, like The seizures have increased and, and I can't read her distress cues anymore. Yeah. And I'm just really worried that she's in pain. Do you yeah. think she's suffering now? No. I just don't want her to no. suffer. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. She's unaware of what's happening. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, I think it's pr probably important you understand we're, we're, we're not together. I've, I've come in separately today, and um, uh, my, my wife gets very emotional, which is why I've been given the uh, medical power of attorney for Melissa, uh, and we, we, we agreed this a long time ago yeah. with the intent that we wouldn't be making any decisions quickly and rushed. Yep. Um, I wasn't aware that Melissa was unwell for, for the last few days. Okay. We, which, we, you know, we, we don't speak every day. That, yes. That's okay. Neil, can I but, just hold you for a second? Does Melissa live with you? She lives with me. I look after her yes. every day. Yes. I take care of her. I do everything. Okay. I understand. I just wanted to clarify the situation. Absolutely. Sasha does a wonderful job. Yeah. But. We, I, I haven't even had a chance to see yet. If there's something that we can do to, as you say, st stop the process, yeah. I, I would. I think we should look into all of that. Okay. And, g and give her an opportunity to, to recover. Okay. And Sasha, that's not your viewpoint, is that right? I, th I think she's got a really poor quality of life, and okay. I'm just worried she's in pain, and I just. I just don't want her to be in pain. Okay. Thank you for both being clear about what you want. I understand that you both want the best for your daughter. You just disagree on what that is. Um, what I want to do is go back to my team, speak to them, see what's happening, and I'll come back to you as well. Are you okay to be here yes. together for the moment? Yes, yes, that's yes. Fine. I've got people coming in. Um, a social worker by the name of Liz is likely to come in very soon <laughs> to help. See that. If there's anything you know, do let us know, okay? okay. All right, thank you. Yep. I'll let you know very soon. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you for everything you're doing. Okay. Thanks, Sasha. So just time for another rhythm check, guys. Compressions so just while the team are, are coming back okay. into their um, treatment, I, I just want a quick voting, please, of, of your feeling about how we should progress from here. Because... What I'm likely to face as I go back into this room is the question about, well, should we intubate or not? Can I ask, please, that you close your eyes to vote here? I'm going to ask you a simple yes or no question. Close your eyes. This is blind polling. Could you put your hands up if you think we should intubate? 
Could you put your hands up if you feel like you shouldn't intubate? Did anybody find that an extraordinarily difficult decision to try and make? Okay. Uh, most of you felt, so you can open your eyes up now, most of you felt that we shouldn't intubate, but there was a big scattering. There was probably a third that did, and that's fine. It is a difficult decision. Let's see what's happening from here. I, I took over I'll the um, team lead role yeah, while you were out. You. Thanks. Look, um, we've deteriorated into an asystole now on our rhythm checks. Okay. We've done a few things. We've given some fluid. Yep. I've got a blood gas back that doesn't really show anything reversible. There's yep. no obvious tension and we're oxygenating at the top end. Okay. In summary, I haven't found any reversible causes to this cardiac arrest. All right. Asystole. We've given this a number of adrenaline doses now. We've given fluids. We've given everything we can to reverse. That's right. Electrolytes, everything fine. Is there any concerns about the team that we've left anything undone? Is there an agreement here that this is something that we would normally be stopping? Yeah, I think so. I think that's where okay. we're going. While I've been in the relatives' room, there are things to tell you, which is that there's disagreement from the family about how far to go and how far we should progress with this. I'm going to bring that family in. I think my feeling is the same as yours, that we need to stop, that this isn't going to continue on. When we come back in, we're moving from a resuscitation phase into a family grief phase. We're going to continue the chest compressions. I'm going to bring them in. I think they'll be okay together. If anything happens, I'm going to pull them out again. We've got social work on the way. When we come in, please, serious chest compressions only, no more adrenaline, no more rhythm checks. We'll have this equipment out of the way, please. We'll allow the family into that side and we'll be stopping soon after they arrive. Keep everything serious, everything settled, okay? Is everybody happy with that decision? Okay. Yes. Great. I'm sorry, I've gone back into the team and I've, and I've asked them how we've progressed and what's happening. And things have got worse rather than better. And I'm sorry. What I'm going to be careful to say is that we're not making decisions based on your preference or your preference. We've now reached a point where, sadly, nothing that we try is going to work. That means that we're not going to be able to restart Melissa's heart. It means that, unfortunately, Melissa's passed away. I know that this is tough, or I'm guessing that this is tough. It's hard for me to even imagine what it's like to be in your position. At the moment, the team are continuing chest compressions, but really to give you the chance to say goodbye. And if you're comfortable to go in, I would like you to come in together if it's possible, hold a hand, say goodbye. She won't be able to respond to you. She won't be able to hear you. She's not aware of the things that you're seeing. Would you feel okay to go in? Do you have any yes. questions for yeah, me before you do? Are you yeah. okay to go in together? Yeah. Yep. Okay, come this way. Come through here. Thank you. This is Sasha and Neil. Please feel that you can hold a hand. Say your goodbyes. Frank, we're going to be stopping CPR at the end of this cycle. going to leave you in peace for a moment. We'll pay our respects as well. And then we'll talk to you about how we can help you next if we can. Okay? Thank you. All right. And we're going to stop the scenario there. Thank you to this team for putting that on. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. That's hard to put on. I'm aware of it now. That's probably also hard to watch. Thank you. 
So what can we learn from it? I'm hoping that we can talk a little bit about negotiations of family members that are actually in conflict with each other, about their desires for their children and about what they see as the best way forward. I'm hoping that we'll get an understanding of when resuscitation should continue and when they should stop. And we have great expertise here. I'm hoping we might get an understanding of the legalities of who it is that's likely to be able to make decisions about a child when there's disagreement. And I've got a panel. <coughs> Damien, can I ask you, did we stop at the right time? Uh, in my opinion, uh, you did, yes. Okay. Liz... I'll give you some feedback. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. I'm sure you will. Uh, <laughs> So I'm I, hoping the feedback will with start with do not run a <laughs> let's stop a rest in front of a live audience <laughs> and online streaming under time pressures, but please do. No, I actually so I, would like I to hear I didn't know what this. I don't want, know what these scenarios are, so I'm learning this as you are learning it and speaking on the fly. So first of all, I thought you did a really nice job. Secondly, it's very rare that parents will come around and be... Often parents are in conflict. It remains about the conflict, and so that actual the skill in communication is to, to almost take it a, a, away from them. So it would be very rare that a dad then would just turn around without a bit more pushback. One of the ways that men deal with grief is through anger and control because um, to just be sad makes them feel very powerless and makes them feel like they've surrendered their parenting role. So that's why you'll often see one parent who is quite adamant that they are actually going to tell you what to do because this is my kid, you don't know her. I was very curious that one of the first things that the ambulance driver said is she's got a very poor quality of life because every single person who has severe cerebral palsy, that's what we hear over and over again and that is very rarely parents' perception, very rarely parents' perception and it's very important that we actually don't use that language in front of them because what we're saying is what you've just done for the last 16 years of your life has been a waste of your time. Now, the way that parents who have kids with cerebral palsy make sense of things is this child is still happy. This child actually experienced life on a very different level than the rest of us. This child is pure. This child has never hurt anyone, never done anything bad. So when we start talking about quality of life, you'll often see people get their backs up straight away. So I would encourage you no, not to even bring that in. Tell me about your child is a very different thing. What sort of things does she normally enjoy? You know, when, not when there's a resuscitation going on. The other thing is I actually loved all of your language right up until, <laughs> <laughs> right up until you said, come and say your goodbyes. Okay. So for me, I personally wouldn't use that language because I'd say come and be with her. We would like to give you back, her back to you. Right? We've taken over. We would now like to recognise who you are and all the magnificent work you have done to get this child to this age. So we would like to give her back to you and we would like you to be present. And I would even sometimes say to mums things like, you are here, you know, you brought her into this world, we'd like you to be here. As, she, you know, as she's leaving this world because you're the most important people, not us. I think stopping resuscitation in front of parents is really important because they actually then get to see visually how hard a whole team is working. Um, but I give parents that, that choice. Um, so what were you going to ask me? I was... <laughs> <laughs> Three quarters of the room came to hear Liz Crow speak. Oh, <laughs> I'm aware of that. I know it. It's all right. Come and have a stand. Oh, God. So any tips that you could give us, Liz, on how to manage or how to um, resolve or progress with a family in crisis where they are in conflict it would be useful. But I'm going to put you under the time pressure that we've just put me under. Okay. Them. How long do I have? Uh, three minutes. Oh, yeah. Any tips? Not the whole, whole thing. Just so first tips. of all, if, when parents are conflicting, for you to say, how do you feel, how do you feel, all you're doing is saying, what's your conflict, what's your conflict, and then it's game on. You know, so I'm going to win. And when people are under pressure, they don't gain resources. They don't go, oh, my child's on the CPR, so I'm going to be really mature and I'm going to self-regulate at this moment. Um, <laughs> that's not normally how parents react. 
what, it's about the conflict. So what I would be saying is, what are your goals for Melissa at this moment? It's a completely different question to what, how do you feel. What are your goals? Mum's goal is, I don't want her to suffer. Chances are, Dad's goal is, I don't want her to suffer. If the conflict had escalated, I probably would have pushed to be, for her to be tubed. I think one of the biggest errors we make in critical care is pressure for time all the time. The thing is, is that sometimes if we slow things down, we get to where we need to get faster. So if he had been absolutely adamant and we could have safely tubed, which maybe we couldn't have, <clears throat> she still might have died, but it would have been like, we, we're not sure that this is the right thing. That's all right to openly say that. But if you feel very strongly about this, we will try to progress this resuscitation knowing that it may stop, you know, that she may still die despite our best intentions. However, our fear for that is the whole time we're going to be active rather than let, allowing you to be with her. And our preference would be for the two of you to hold her and kiss her and touch her and talk to her. That would be our preference. That's a, again, it's a very different way of shaping things up other than, you know, what do you think we should do? Because people don't know. The other thing is, is that people often assume that with these kids with cerebral palsy, which we will be seeing more and more and more frequently, and it is the biggest source of conflict in the hospital on the whole mm. these days, is that... Um, I've lost my train of thought. That's right. I drank too much last night. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wait, yeah, that video that can be edited, I'm sure. <laughs> but did, that didn't just happen, that little statement. Kids, don't watch this. But I think, I think with these kids with cerebral palsy, we're going to be seeing it more and more and more where they're going to be coming, you know, a whole range of things where these children are quite disabled. We're making assumptions. But the other thing is, is that these kids, we tube them and then we successfully extubate them, they live. You know, so... Um, sometimes it, that's what I was going to say, slowing things down can often get us to a point. And so it might be that she's only tubed for a couple of days and dad can see what's going on and then he gets to have a choice. What I always say is parents are the long-term survivors. So often in the heat of this moment, everyone's like, this is what needs to happen, this is what needs to happen. In a week's time, I might come in and say, how do you guys feel about Melissa? And you'll be like, Melissa who? Uh, that's not what these parents' experience will be. <laughs> So they are the long-term survivors. Giving them another 48 hours, you know, we can talk about resources and everything. We are very fortunate we're not living in a budget through time and maybe we will get there, but we're not so economically constrained that we can't give someone an extra 48 hours to get their heads around. The other thing is, is that um, during that time, we also might be able to have conversations about organ and tissue donation, yep. you know, which okay. then gives people a whole new sense of meaning making and, and ways of being able to go into bereavement in a much healthier way than if they felt railroaded into a decision in the ED. But I, you know, he got there. I thought you did a lovely job. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so it's, again, it's just important to, to say again, the clinical endpoint of there was an asystolic arrest and we were way beyond an organ donation type situation in the outskirts of Melbourne. It's not an ECMO centre, it's not anything like that. Um, I asked you briefly, Damien, whether you were comfortable with the idea of stopping then. Do you want to speak and elaborate on that a little bit more and you're yeah, welcome have, to the... Have we got time for... Uh, yeah, minute. We, we, can, we can have you five minutes with no, oh, with no well, problems okay. at all. So my goals are a little different from Liz's, if I'm using uh, her way of, of thinking about this uh, particular issue. Um, just the, the intubation thing, I think, is really interesting, highlighted uh, by Ian. Um, in my mind, you have a child here who is in asystole. The, the, the outlook is, is bleak, and there has been no indication that th this child is going to recover whether you intubate or not at that stage, which is why I think that's a relatively critical decision. The, the challenge is, is if the Ian had made an even harder scenario where you have some, maybe some evidence of uh, slightly different waveforms, you maybe get a return of pulse, what, what do you do then? I think that's a, a, a very different challenging discussion. Mm -hmm. but, but in this situation, you have a child who, w without the conflict, the team uh, would have um, uh, stopped, I, I, I suspect. 
And I, um, interesting, just in terms of the only difference I would have done is that in the department in which I work, and I know this isn't universal, those parents would have been in the room instantly. Yeah. That there would have been no outside the room. Um, and actually, that would have posed an interesting like, dilemma because that conflict may have occurred around in front of the clinical team. Um, and Ian did an expert job of managing that and kept them separate. Actually, I wonder what, how I would have addressed that, because in the real world, we would have had both, pa both parents in there while everything was going on and would have then had to start managing that situation, um, which, which throws up all sorts of uh, kind of different bits and pieces. Um, but just from, a, from this particular clinical case, given the fact you were asystole, given the fact that full CPR had been going on for a period of time, and that I think I heard this correctly, is that you were able to deliver an ad adequate airway and breathing maneuvers without the tube in place, mm. I would have been happy continuing with that. So uh, Damien wishes we had a more complex scenario. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the next one's going to be super easy. These people are like never happy, are they? They just want to be challenged. <laughs> Okay, thank you. We can move on now into our next scenario, but as we do, there may be time for a brief question, if there's anything, Andrew, which, which hopefully might, if you allow one to be directed towards Catherine, is there any that would suit? Yeah, I think, so in these complex situations, how can you actually establish the legitimacy of the medical power of attorney when there's conflict among the family members? Because this happens out of hours. Always. Uh, I think it's hard to establish it even when you're in hours. Mm. Um, and I think the, all the points Liz made in terms of the decision making and um, the discussions with the family is really what's crucial here rather than the actual le legal legitimacy. Because if you, in my view, if you focus on the legal and not the scenario, not the two, what, what I consider there to be two difficult decisions. One might have been to continue treatment or not to continue. And then the second issue is the issue about who gets to decide that between the parents. Mm -hmm. So in that environment, if you're thinking about legals, you've got a really big problem. Mm -hmm. And I just 100% support what these guys are saying, which is um, first of all, focus on the clinical and the medical, make sure you get that right, so then you don't need to come to my office and say you've made a mistake and we need to call the insurance company. But the second thing is to keep that, keep that family um, conversation going so that you actually never call my office. That, that would be my advice in that situation and you will never be able to establish the proper legitimacy because either one of them, no matter who has a piece of paper, mm. actually has um, the ability and, um, and, and the legal backing, really, to make decisions for that child. And we all know it's better if they do that together. All right, Catherine, correct? I'm going to oh. head you off there. Sorry, Liz, just because we're going to need to progress. So what I, I like from that is that we had a sense of agreement from the panel about some of the things that we suggested. And you might have noticed one of the techniques that I used on the parents was talking about what they did agree on rather than concentrating, hopefully, initially on what they disagreed with or at least brought that up, um, which I've found useful in the past. But while the department's been busy, something else has been happening. So we've had a little bit of a debrief, the staff and I, about that patient. But during it, there was a resident who came to me who wasn't actually involved in that at all. And it was a first or second year resident, a really good one, a very confident one who was telling me about a 13-year-old uh, girl whose name is Scarlett. And Scarlett's had a couple of days of fever and a headache, and Scarlett, um, I thought, needed an LP. There didn't seem to be any contraindications to an LP. It seemed to be completely reasonable. And I had a chat to this doctor whose name was Frank, and I said, look, it sounds like you need one. Um, are you confident to do it? And he said, yes. And I said, have you done them before? And he said, yes. And I said, you know, have you, have you done any unsupervised? And he said, no, but I've done a couple supervised and I feel like this is one that I can do. And I think particularly because of the debrief and everything else, I, was, I just said, look, look, go ahead. I'll pop in there as soon as I can and see how things are going. Sorry to interrupt, Ken. I've just seen a 65-year-old chap just come in with chest pain. Yep. Uh, I'm, I'm worried that he might be having a stemi. I just don't know if I need to call the cath lab straight away. Do you mind if we just have a look at these? Yeah, things? sure. Started working by now. Okay, we're just going to introduce the needler. Well, has it worked or is it not? 
so it mm -hmm. should have still be starting to work now. So can mm. we wait until it has work? So can <laughs> I think we should probably just crack on and, um, and get, get, get this done. Okay, cool. She seems to be... Ah! Uh, so That's hurting. Are you sure you know what you're doing? Okay, it's... Obviously, right. it can hurt a little bit. But yeah, cold cuts very much. Definitely. I think that's one to go. Also, on. it wasn't. There's a sharp pain down my leg. There's a, there's a pain in the that's leg. That's, that a norm, doesn't that's a normal part of the procedure. That doesn't sound normal. It's uh, <laughs> that that's very common. We don't worry about that so much. Don't we? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> you okay? Yeah, hi, Frank. I'm just uh, coming behind you. It's hurting her. Yeah. I look at. Um, Hello there. I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Ian. I'm the senior doctor on today. Hi. And this I'm is your Sasha, and this daughter, is Scarlett. Scar hello, Scarlett. I know you can't turn around. I'll say hello from there. Are you okay? Yeah. Uh, he's causing her quite a lot of pain. Are, are you sure you know what you're doing? Look, yeah. I mean, I've done I've done a number of these before, and you know. Well, well how many? Look, um, in this department, we do lots of these. So. Yeah, but this is, <laughs> this is a, in this department, we do lots of these. This is a very common procedure in our department. I'm just trying to work out um, what's happening here. Yeah, but how many have you done? Um, well, uh, I don't know the exact number, but uh, I mean, <laughs> I did one uh, recently, not that long ago. On, uh, so you've done one? Um, more than okay, one. let's put a time out on there. Because <laughs> I am sweating now. <laughs> Sasha, you seemed a little annoyed. Why? What was you thinking? Well, she seemed to be in quite a lot of pain. Yeah. And you seemed to be fluffing around a little bit. <laughs> I've just done 15 minutes of CPR. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different patient. Okay. So there, there was a, a tad of, of fluffing. I think that that's fair. Damien, have you been in this position before or something similar? Uh, yes. Which <laughs> My position as the senior. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes. yeah sorry, yeah. That, Are you yes, remembering yes. back <laughs> <laughs> to a younger, less wrinkled, <laughs> less grey Damien? <laughs> How did you handle it? In fact, let's channel the younger, less wrinkled, less wise Damien. How do you handle those sorts of questions? Um, so there's... So a, a couple of approaches. Part of it is, and this is a little unfair, is actually on your relationship with the, the junior doctor and how well that you, you actually know them. Mm. Um, because I've been in two situations. So, so one of which was a, a doctor who clearly is expert in what they do, very experienced, had done the thing lots before, and had made, I think, as a, a minor mistake or had failed to get in a cannula in a... Uh, a neonate who w was known to have difficult access with parents who were very used to lots of cannulation attempts and father became very angry mm. and said, why is it that this always happens? And kind of um, blew up and said, you're doing it all wrong. So the, now that's, I'm not saying that was an easy situation, but it was much easier for me to guide the family through because I, I was confident that the, the doctor involved did know what they were doing and I could describe that this was a difficult situation. Now, the, the challenge for, for this one is actually, is there some agreement with the, the parent or carer that actually there might be a potential technical difficulty and how you manage that uh, situation? And it's how openly or at what time you acknowledge that. Okay. Uh, because the, actually the, what really important thing is, is the patient safe at this time? That's what you need to get, get sorted. You don't sure. need to have a discussion. It's All right. The... Liz, I'm going to get you to put your ethics committee hat on, if that's okay now. Yeah. What are the ethics of teaching procedures in a teaching hospital? Um, God, I don't know. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, we are, a, when you're in a tertiary teaching hospital, most parents have to sign a consent to say that they understand that, you know, students or whatever, that is part of what they sign when they come through, which lots of people don't actually understand. Most people just want their kid to be seen, so they just sign away. Um, but it's for, well, that's what it says in our hospital, something about this is a teaching hospital, you know, blah, blah. I, that doesn't take away from the fact that number one priority, it doesn't matter if you're coming from an ethical point of view or from a medical point of view, is your patient's safety. So that supersedes everything else. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing is, is that from an 
ethics, we're now always supposed to practice from a family-centred position. And where I think our doctor has gone wrong in the first instance is in his communication. So when you give people, when you, I've said this a number of times, if you take the time early on, you will reduce the time long term. So if you go in and you say, hi, my name is Frank, the department's been quite busy, I'm very sorry that you've been waiting, one of the things we're waiting to do is a lumbar puncture, it's normally a bit scary, this is the sorts of things you're going to, immediately you're building confidence. Because people are like, this person cares about me, I'm building confidence. Mm. And so then when they start to do the procedure, if something goes wrong, people give you a lot more leeway. If you come in and you're like, oh, I'm the doctor, roll over, get into a curl, I'm going to have to shove this in. As soon as something goes wrong, people are like... I'm not going to go there, I'm oh. not going to go there. <laughs> it can only get me in trouble. <laughs> wow. Okay. Nice work, please. I'm going to use that actually as a break, as much as it was funny. <laughs> Catherine and Lorraine, should the number of times I've done a procedure be part of my consent for that procedure? Okay, so there's a couple of interesting issues here. I'm, I'm um, spotting a new client here um, <laughs> for a cu couple of reasons. One, the first is that um, you've got a mother sitting there and she's watching a procedure and there are real question marks about whether this person possesses the requisite skills um, to do that procedure, just based on what I saw, I'm no expert. So the second question is, so, th so that goes to what we call standard of care in the law, law of negligence. So in the law, it, it ac the law doesn't expect that you tell everybody your qualifications, your year level, in, for example, how many years you've been out of university um, for each procedure, but it does expect that a person doing that procedure possesses the right skills and experience. It's as simple as that. So if he doesn't do that and the patient's injured down the track, then we have a problem. The second issue then comes to inform consent. And regardless of what consent forms uh, the family fills out when they come to hospital, the mother has asked a specific question and does anybody remember Rogers and Whitaker, the case of the, the eye case? So what that, the High Court said in that is there are two tests here. There's an objective test. You should tell your patients objectively what they need to know to make a decision um, about whether to receive treatment or not. So that's the objective test. The second test is the subjective test. And here, the mother has asked a, a clear question because subjectively, it's important to her at that moment in time to know that the doctor has the right skills to, to do the lumbar puncture. So because she's asked, he really is obliged to answer. Otherwise, she can't really make an informed decision about whether she really wants Scarlett to have the lumbar puncture or to say, stop here, I'd actually prefer Dr. Summers come in and do it himself. Can I ask, so who's the onus of responsibility on? Is it on Frank or is it on Ian as the senior consultant who has said, you know, like, if, say it all goes terribly wrong and then it becomes a legal case, who's most at risk? Is it Frank or is it Ian? So that's an interesting question. It's actually everybody, really. So... <laughs> Not the social worker, surely. <laughs> 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 no, we're, social workers are far too valuable and we don't want them in court when we um, are defending these, so we tend to leave them out of it. But essentially everybody, so normally what happens in public hospitals, as most of you will know, is it's actually the hospital who's responsible to ensure that the patient gets proper care. So very rarely in a public hospital situation, certainly in Victoria, would either Dr Summers or the junior doctor, whose name I've forgotten... Frank. Frank normally they wouldn't be named as defendants. If, however, Ian is wandering around and asking the patients if they'd like to be private patients, and then he's billing Scarlett privately, then he is separately named. And what will then have to happen is the two insurance companies, both for Ian and for the hospital, will have to work out contributions in the, in the event that um, Scarlett ends up with, you know, lower back pain for the rest of her life, unable to work. Mum, of course, has nervous shock. Um, she's suffering from a psychiatric injury um, as a result of viewing the um, incompetent procedure, um, sorry, Frank, um, being undertaken. 
under uh, Dr. Summer's supervision. <laughs> Sorry, I sound like a plain No, no, lawyer, that's okay. Then, that's I? okay. I, th I think even hearing my name in the sentence with named as the defendant <laughs> was enough to actually trigger in me significant psychological damage, and I will be seeking damages myself. What I'm interested, though, is that when Mum asked about his experience, you felt that that was important to the consent but that requires her to ask. Is there a requirement on us to volunteer up to that level of consent if we're not asked? No, because the law presumes that the hospital is providing a level of care that is appropriate for that patient, including that it's a teaching hospital. Um, but it, it expects that if Frank is doing a procedure, first of all, that he is being appropriately supervised by the consultant. And if he's not being appropriately supervised or he doesn't have the skill, then somebody else should take over. Okay, let's switch yeah. you off from being yeah. panel members for the moment. Yes, go for it. Really quickly, one yeah. of the things that is amazing for us is when we have a play specialist on, and play specialists are amazing arbiters of skill, and I've often been grabbed by a play specialist to say, Damien, get in here now, this doctor doesn't know what he's doing, because it's not even, because just the way they've gone in and approached it, is it's, it's be clear that they don't have that competency set. And play specialists are invaluable in, in helping those. We, we do that constantly, where yeah. we go, dude, just hold off for a second, and then I <laughs> phone a friend or I run and say, I, I would go in there if I was you. I've got this great okay. visual image of a play specialist blowing a Morse code <laughs> bubble, <laughs> SOS. Um, I hope there's not a play specialist that's like putting pins into a little rag doll that represents me at the moment. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm <laughs> appreciative of, of those answers as experts in law, social work and clinicians. I'm, I'm asking you now as perhaps patients. If you were the patient in that condition, would the answer that you've given be different about what you would want from that communication and the consent? Is it still the same or do you want to know the individual experience of that practitioner when they come to you with a scalpel or come to you doing a procedure on you? At, um, at six weeks, no, five weeks old, uh, my youngest daughter was admitted with a high fever, had a full septic screen, um, and I know there must have been a discussion about who was going to do the lumbar puncture on my child in front of me, mm. um, and it turned out to be one of my consultant colleagues, who I think that must have been probably one of the most stressful procedures that they've ever done. Um, but it's interesting, having thought about it, would I have asked if I'd have had a doctor not known to me who was junior come in and do it, and I wasn't put in that situation. But I think, I feel uncomfortable about it, just thinking about it. Yeah. But that's a massive bias. I just. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, sh I shouldn't say this, but if anything happens to my children or my nieces and nephew in regional towns, I, all I say is, I work, I work in paediatric intensive care. And then when people say, are you a doctor? I go. <laughs> 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 And I always get exceptional care as a result. <laughs> <laughs> I find that it's usually the consultant that comes around after that. But I, I have on a number of occasions, my, my son's got anaphylaxis to dairy, egg and nuts, and twice I've been caught in a regional hospital where people have wanted to give Ventolin. And, and I'm always, if, if you're unable to do this, I'd like someone to come and retrieve him. Okay. <laughs> And I find that people use So it's an indirect answer to this idea of I work in a paediatric intensive care and they're doing their best to make sure that your child is looked after in your unit <laughs> by <laughs> treating their anaphylaxis with I know what I'm talking ventilant. about, but I yeah. do Catherine, can I ask you the same thing? Yes, well, when I go into the ED with my children, I always tell them I'm a lawyer, so that always gets... <laughs> <laughs> but I do think um, people... Uh, healthcare recipients, including myself, want more and more information from mm. our, um, our doctors and um, clinical teams, and frankly, we're entitled to it. Mm. So if, if, if you, you are asked a specific question, what's the big secret? Um, and, in, and in the world of Dr Google, I, I just don't think there can be really any excuse for not um, helping to inform your patients better about what, what is to be expected. And the, the caveat to that for me is when my brother was diagnosed with a non-curable non lymphoma, I had to stop reading, which was the first time in my life that I hadn't wanted to be informed. Mm. I wanted the doctor to 100% be in control because I just needed to be a grieving sister. And I, I negotiated us to a point where 
I was 100% confident who we had, and I manipulated yes. the system to the best of my ability to get there. But <coughs> once I was there, I actually 100% just wanted to hand it over. Mm. Do you want to add anything, Dami? No. Um, what I'm hoping is that there have been questions, both live ones that have been uh, elicited from here, and there are microphones across the back there, also ones that have come through online, potentially even from this audience into Twitter. Uh, Andrew, is there anything can that you Can I just seen? say something? Oh, you look yes. very uncomfortable, Scott. You can move now if you want, <laughs> darling. <laughs> Situational awareness. Nice. Is there one more tonight? Yeah. OK, no, so no, I think no, no. one of the things that a couple of the people who actually do regular procedures have pointed out is that their first thing they say when they get a consent is the most common sort of complication is a failed procedure. So setting up those expectations in advance. And then this is what I'm going to do if I, I don't get this access. I know personally that consultants aren't always the best people to put in cannulas and LPs. Mm. And certainly that's one of the big challenges as a consultant going forward, is that I want my trainees to be able to do all these core procedures, and then I am credentialed if I do one simulated intubation a year. <laughs> okay. My registrars do them once a week. I know who I would rather be intubating my child. Um, and Caitlin has pointed out, if we've always got to have someone there to help with our procedures, what about that very first time? It's the middle of the night. There's no one else around. It's just you as the resident in your little country town, and you've got to put a cannula in or do an LP. What do you do then? I, I guess that, in a way, is why a teaching hospital is a teaching hospital, to skill up, to progress, that we have an ethical responsibility, not just an individual patient, but to uh, a community benefit of raising the procedural skills of a community, and that's the hard balance. Damien, do you have something you wanted to add? Uh, just um, in regards, uh, should we finish off this case? I've got another thing about the previous case I've just realised. Go for it. To... Wherever you want to go. go. I'm in <laughs> your hands. So I just think this has come up a lot recently uh, in our department about so children who are coming in in cardiac arrest and the time that the decision is made to call the time of death. Um, and a, a, um, one of the principles that I have, as soon as the child arrives, and this is particular for children under the age of one who are a kind of a, a sudden unexpected or, or cot death, um, is that actually is that child has levido or rigor mortis? Because we've had a couple of occasions mm. where children have come in and it's not that they are, that they've been dead clearly for a while and the ambulance crew, bless their consorts, have just taken the child and run with them because they're not going to make the decision to stop. And that child has come in, the team start, but it's not a case of a debate. This child is part, completely past the point of return and stopping then immediately is something that I have found difficult to do, but as our consultant body, we are doing more often. It's mm. literally, actually, everyone stop because this child has been dead at least for a, an hour or so. Um, and that has caused a, a bit of emotional conflict, mm. especially if the parents are there, but I don't believe you can continually actively resuscitating a child who is stiff. Uh, I, I just wanted to put that out there because I, mm. I forgot to say it earlier, um, but it, it, it is, um, I, I think something that has, has, has caused uh, distress. Mm. And, and then the flip side is ensuring that you, you can't actually feel a pulse is the other thing that has come up with a lot of resuscitation and not getting the leads on. Um, and from a senior point of view, we try and get there very early just so you're satisfied. Is this child completely dead or actually is there something going on? It's an interesting one where I've had that situation a couple of times, particularly early in my career, it used to happen a lot more. Um, and I had a slightly different thought. It wasn't a department policy, but if there was CPR coming in, then we would continue for long enough to actually just establish a checklist of, yes, all the facts are what we expect, and prepare the ambulance officers for stopping. Mm. And I think that's yeah. the, you know, the care of our paramedics when they've come in and they've faced a very different intensity of experience in a home uh, where something has happened to trigger them to start, I think us taking three minutes to stop and preparing them for the fact that we're stopping and checking that comfort level is, I think, in some ways respectful to our paramedics. Um, but I understand the, your concerns parents. as well. Yeah. And I, I don't think you should like be putting lines in and stuff, but in those parents' minds, they'll be thinking, if we can just get to the hospital, everything's going to yeah. be okay. 
And so I think for them to get there, see the team, see them at least make a checklist will be mm. of comfort for them as well that the so, paramedics had done everything yeah. they could. And Certainly there, there becomes a point in every resuscitation and I expect everybody in this audience has, has seen it at different times when there's a transition between a resuscitation that's taking place for the benefit of the patient in the hope of a recovery and a resuscitation that moves into a grief stage of looking after the relatives and potentially the staff and just checking that those things are done before we actually cease. Mm. Uh, and that, that switching of progression between the one aim and the other, I think, as I've got older and hopefully wiser, but certainly more grey hair, is a feeling of making that much more explicit to the people that are there of the family are going to come in, we're now moving into a phase of assisting this family with our grieving. That is now the purpose of this CPR, it's a transition point or to buy us time for that grief process. And we, we've had a couple of situations recently where parents have said, you know, we're 20 minutes away, we're 13 minutes away, we're, and where I think that everybody in the team really appreciated that the consultant said, this child has died, we are continuing with CPR for the only point that the, we stop as the parents arrive. Mm. But they got consent from everyone in the team to keep going yeah. because the child had, had clearly yeah. died. And those challenging ones are the ones where it's like, oh, I'm, I'm two hours away, I'm an hour away, and you're like, well, have you got check bags or are you... You yeah. know, is it overhead locker stuff? And there's this terrible, how long do we keep going? How long do we yeah. keep this team? How long do we keep our resus bay occupied? And that sounds terrible, but mm. that is a pressure that we've got, is that there might be somebody else coming in. The other thing is, is there's no one there and you can't do anything, is we've also had occasion where we'll say to the parents, can you please pull over? You wait till the car has stopped. And then you say, your child is, is actually, has died. Mm. CPR is still in. We're going to put you on speakerphone so you can talk to her and we will stop. But again, warn your team because the noise out of those phones can be quite, it's yep. quite distressing. Yeah. Mm. Is there another question coming through, Andrew? Uh, not at the moment, and everyone's just captivated by listening to Liz, to be honest. I'm sorry, there is... <laughs> <laughs> there is a, they wanted to do some sort of keynote later on, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, g'day, Digby from Port Macquarie. I just, um, I just well, m thought maybe there's a study in this that, uh, you know, by declaring ourselves as doctors or lawyers um, to medical, you know, to the medical profession when we turn up, um, whether you actually get uh, over-investigated, second-guessed, worse care. Well, we know the compilation rate doubles as soon as you're a doctor or you're a family member. I don't know whether that's anecdotal, whether that's true, but it seems to be true. And that might be some of the origin of that feeling, is we get special care, and that special care sometimes causes us harm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I often find that it, it, it's not a helpful thing to know in, uh, because you, you're suddenly taken out of your normal sense of, I do, you know, I'm doing my okay. best, making the best decisions I can, so suddenly, what are yeah. the implications of... I think one of the hardest things to do as a family member is to give up that, that ownership as a doctor and do what uh, was Liz was saying, was actually say, look, um, can you just treat me like a family member, explain everything to me as if I wasn't a doctor, still have some ability to make informed decisions because you don't give up that part. But that's an interesting conversation to have with a doctor when they're bringing their families in, is to say, look, at a certain point, how about you just become a family member? I'll still check with you, I'll still explain, I'll still get your opinion, but really your job here is to be a brother or a sister or a father. We've got lots of doctors here, we don't need another one. I uh, just want to comment about the intubation of the child and their systole. Yep. What if, in your professional opinion, treatment is futile? Surely we're not obliged to undertake treatment that's futile. I think that's where we were. When and, I was, and, saying, no, no, when I was saying that, it wasn't, I, I wasn't saying this particular scenario. I was just saying that yeah. sometimes buying ourselves some time but, is good, but that child was clearly going to die. But, but if, if, if the parents said, Sorry. I no, insist no. you intubate, we're entitled, I believe, to say that's yeah. pointless and I won't. Is that the case? What do the lawyers think about that? Yes, you're not, enti you're not required to give any treatment that you consider to be clinically inappropriate or futile. But I, I would encourage you never to say futile or pointless mm. um, because when we're doing good palliation or good terminal care, there's still a lot that we can do. It's just that our focus has completely changed. Yeah. Damien? Do you want something? No. No, I'll okay, fine. Yeah. So then I, I would like to question. say, oh, I'm sorry, I think we're out of time, apologies. Oh. Uh, do ask it, the panel will be here.
Yeah. I did want to wrap because, can the guys come up from down beneath there, please? There's a lot of thank yous to be said, so I want at least five minutes to do it. Uh, Andrew, come and join us as well, mate. So firstly, for this team, um, you might have thought that we'd employed a whole lot of professional actors. Uh, Scarlett, who is, of course, a family member. <laughs> Brendan Morrissey, who is one of our emergency physicians, Frank Leader, Alex Handrinos, both emergency registrars at St Vincent's, Clarissa and Candice and Jude, who are all fantastic crit care nurses and also um, valuable members of our simulation team. We've got Andrew West, who is another emergency physician. Sasha, Rosé. I've got it right, haven't I? <laughs> Imagine if she said no. <laughs> uh, who's an emergency physician, a paediatric emergency physician from Adelaide, not a paid professional actor. <laughs> Very good. But is absolutely sensational acting. Thank you so much. Those were genuine tears that came out. If you thought I looked uncomfortable on stage, it wasn't just squatting down. I was intensely uncomfortable that I didn't have tissues at hand as she started to cry. Thank you. Neil Cunningham, uh, my great friend and emergency physician at St Vincent's and simulation instructor and extraordinary educator. Uh, very much appreciate your... For all of those people that flinched when he said, my wife gets emotional, that is a constructed line. He is not a complete and utter. <laughs> As I turn this way to the panel, we have got Damien Rowland, superb clinician, great researcher, great friend, Liz, same. Thanks, Liz Crow, thank you for getting out of bed this morning, <laughs> crawling your way up to us. Thank you for your insights, your wisdom, and your skill at what you do. Catherine Lorenz, thank you again for your insights, legal insights. She is apparently on call for the entirety of Australia now, 24 <laughs> hours a day. I've got her mobile number. I'll be publishing it on the internet soon. It'll get tweeted out. Thank you. Andy. Done. Ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> thank you.